This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. His plan for us has not changed. After we're saved, he wants us to grow in the things of God. As we are growing in the things of God, God will send certain things along where he makes requests of us. Why? He knows we're able to handle it at the time. He doesn't ask us before that time. He asks us at that time. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. We're going to be taking up for a couple of days on discipleship and what God has called us at earth for and really to be honest with you in your own ministry. You know, God will save you and you can remain a child for the rest of your Christian life if you want to, but that's not God's desire. And really, God won't put you in the ministry until you're mature and maturity is part of the ministry. And I don't care if that ministry is being a business person or whatever, you can go into business, but as far as being a disciple of the Lord, if you haven't matured in the Word of God, you are not truly a disciple of the Lord. A disciple of the Lord is one who produces fruit. A disciple of the Lord is one who loves people around him. The disciple of the Lord is one who stands on the Word of God during the circumstances of life and sees God come through. This is maturity. This is what God's plan is in this earth. And so not only would he go into all the world and preach the gospel, whoever listens and whoever is saved, uh, whoever believes will be saved and whoever does not be, uh, believe will be damned. This is just the essence of the gospel, but that's the gospel. And we're to preach the gospel. But next of all, he says in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Salvation is instantaneous, but discipleship takes the entire rest of your life as you grow in the things of God. Uh, salvation occurs in your spirit. The moment you're born again, your spirit becomes made in the image of God, cannot sin, does not sin, and there's no sin in there. But uh, literally, when it comes to discipleship, that's your soul, the renewing of the mind. You used to have been thinking this way. If you're saved at 35 years, then you've had 35 years of the world's way of thinking. You gotta undo that. The word has to undo that. And that comes by, again, the renewing of your mind, meditating on the promises of God, studying the promises of God, getting revelation of the word of God, hiding his word in your heart that you might not sin against God. Hiding his word in your heart literally means you have resistance toward the things of life. This is what God's desire. That's what this broadcast is all about. This broadcast that I am teaching right now is part of the ministry God has given to me to help raise up a new generation of ministers and also of disciples in this earth because that is really where your ministry begins to the world. It's through discipleship. Not only a word you can speak to them, but what you can show them. God wants you to show the world through word and through deed. And the deed comes when you begin to live by the word of God and you become a living example of Jesus Christ in this earth. This is what this is dedicated to. Yes, I love seeing people say, but you know what the real the real joy of my heart is? Is to see a person after they're saved, their life begins to change. They study the word of God and they begin to think like Christ. They now have instead the mind of Bill or the mind of Susan or whoever they are, they have the mind of Christ and they start to let that thought come through them. Now people begin to see Jesus Christ in them, not because they're saved, but because they are now living by the word of God. When temptation came to Jesus, he said three times, it's written, it's written, it's written. We need to be able to say it is written, but to say it is written, we need to know it is written, understand why it was written. That's where study comes from. So this is what my ministry is set forth to. And literally go around the world and have people come to me and say, I attended your church, I've sat under your ministry, totally changed my life, made me from a spiritual nobody to a spiritual somebody. And that's the essence of the word of God because God is still in the business of taking nobodies and making somebodies out of them through salvation and then through the uh, engrafting of the word of God into their heart. If you'd like to become a partner with me in this ministry and help see a number, a new generation of disciples coming up around you, then would you contribute to this? ministry, more than just your prayers, more than just your time of saying, Lord, thank you for Pastor Bob. And, oh, that was a great sermon today. Oh, that was a great teaching. That you become also involved financially because this is the way God spreads the gospel on the earth today. I know it's free. I know it's grace that brings the gospel to you, but somebody has to pay to get it to you. Water is free. 
All right, but somebody has to pump it to you and you pay them to, to pump the water to you. Vegetables don't charge you to come out of the ground, but we do pay somebody to go pick those vegetables and send them to a factory somewhere. They come out in a can or they come out in a grocery store and they're in the produce section, all these things like that. All, everything God gives in this earth is by grace. It's free, but we pay to get it there. So this, God, this message I'm preaching is coming by television. It also comes by printed word. It comes by the internet, all these things, but it takes money to operate these things. You know what? Every dollar, every penny you put into the ministry will count eternally in heaven. You, there's no rewards in heaven for your BMW. There's no rewards in heaven for your five bedroom home. And God doesn't care if you have these things as long as these things don't have you. But the next thing is, is whatever you put in the gospel, that will have eternal rewards because the Bible says in Revelation 14, 13, when we die, our works do follow us. And that also includes the giving of your finances into the kingdom of God. Want to join me? Want to join my hand? Want to become a partner with me? Then simply go to bobyandian.com and you'll find out how you can become a partner with me. I'd love to have you become a partner. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you in advance. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Here we have an example of discipleship that Abraham had already believed in the Lord. He had believed the Lord, it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he'd been studying God's word, listening to God speak to him, following God's voice. Uh, however God got to him, he was listening to it, and then there came a day when God says, now it's time to make a choice. This was not a test of his salvation. This was a test of discipleship. God doesn't need to test your salvation. Why? Because it's always there. But discipleship is something you have to choose to do, choose to grow in. And now God puts that to a test when he says here in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, away from your relatives and your father's house into a land that I will show you. And I will make out of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. God basically told Abraham to do one thing. That one thing was forsake everything that you're attached to. I want you to forsake your country. I want you to forsake your family. I want you to forsake your relatives. I want you to forsake even your father and your mother and just grab your wife and go to a country I'm going to show you. God asked you to do one thing, turn loose of everything that you're attached to. And then God promised, if you'll do that, I've got eight things I will give to you. Most rewards in the Christian life are literally exactly that. They are rewards. There's also gifts in the Christian life. And for a gift, you just reach out and take it. But rewards are given to you for your obedience in the things of God. There's Christians today saying, well, there is no such thing as, as you know, having to obey God because all that is works and all that. No, there is good works. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we are saved unto good works. In other words, before salvation, you couldn't do good works. But after salvation, God demands that you do good works under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. It's good works that are part of your witness to the world. I mean, we witness in two ways again, by word and by deed. And God is simply saying, I want you to do something where to show people around you, you really have accepted me as your savior. You really are obedient to me. I talked to Bible school students who have forsaken everything. They laid their mom, their dad, their uh, their businesses. They sell everything. They come to a Bible school. And while their parents are yelling, it's a cult, it's a cult. Don't get involved in it. Come back to the home. Come back to the church that your grandparents went to, your parents went to. Uh, raise your children around this church because, and they'll go to every kind of excuse and all that, but they know they've heard from God. And lovingly, they tell mom and dad, mom and dad, we love you, but you know what? This is God's call. Like We have to obey God. We want to obey God. God has a plan for our life. And many times it's not until years later, they might come back to that town and start a church and mom and daddy end up being saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, joining that church, working in that church, and just tell their kids, thank you for obeying God. And thank you for not listening to us at that time. Uh, this happened with Elisha. Elisha had to leave the oxen. In fact, even burned one behind him to show he's burning his bridges behind him. And he stepped out to follow Elijah and basically said, I'll never go back to farming again. This is my life from now on. This is what God asked Abraham to do and Sarah to do, and then he promised he would do eight things for them. So again, this is discipleship, a test of our love for God. We are to leave mothers and fathers and wives and countries and possessions, and this will be found later on in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. 
And so this happens in marriage. We're told in Genesis chapter two and verse 24, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. One of the worst things that can happen in a marriage is have meddling in-laws and the, the, the daughter listens to her mom and dad or the dad or the husband listens to his mom and dad. You are to join yourself. And when the Bible says that for this cause shall you leave your mother and father, that doesn't mean you'll leave them and never see them. Doesn't mean you won't have fellowship with them. It means you leave the authority that clean power they might have to you. And this is what God was telling Abraham, walk away from all this. I don't want your father to have control over you. I don't want your mother to have control over you. Yes, his father was extremely rich, but yet he said, I want you to break away from that. I will be your exceeding great reward. I will be your prosperity. I'll lead you to these places. So again, what God told Abram again was to do this one thing and that's desert everything that had any kind of control over him. Go to a brand new land. I'm going to show you from this land. In fact, where he sent him to was eventually the land of Israel and uh, the Canaan land. And this is where God would bless all his inhabitants and his descendants after that time period. So again, he said this would happen in marriage. It happened with Elisha when he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. That was 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. And there he literally ran off and followed after Elijah when the mantle was thrown upon him. Jesus told us our new families are those who do the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 12, verses 48 through 50. And when Jesus was talking to those around him, they said, oh, how wonderful it is. Where's your mom? Where's your brothers and sisters? He said, look around you. See all these who's believed in me? Those who are following me? That's my mother. That's my father. That's my brother. That's my sister. He's simply saying in that particular portion of scripture that those who follow after the Lord, your Christian friends around you become greater than any friend you've ever had. The moms and dads around you become your spiritual moms and dads. In other words, you're closer to your family in the Lord than you are your family in the natural. And your family in the Lord is eternal. Your family in the natural may not be eternal. Uh, you don't, you're not husbands and wives in heaven. You're not necessarily brothers and sisters in heaven when you go there, but you do have those in the, in the body of Christ that will be with you forever in heaven too. It could be your moms and dads don't get saved in this lifetime. I pray they will. Your brothers and sisters won't get saved, but I pray they will. Your nephews and nieces and uncles and aunts and all that, I pray they will, but they may not. You may not see them in eternity, but you know what? The ones you hang around with at church, the ones you fellowship, you'll be with them forever, for eternity. And this is what Jesus said. This is my real family right here around me, not just the physical flood, uh, flesh and blood of people around me. So again, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 12, those who do the will of the Father are the ones that God said would be blessed. Most blessings in the Christian life are conditional. Abraham only had uh, only partially obedient and kept trying to rescue himself before he utterly departed following God and depending on God. God said, leave your family. Well, he took his father with him. And in chapter seven of the book of Acts, we are told he went to Herod and there, uh, he was there for some time until his father died. He also took his nephew Lot with him. And that of course brought on the whole thing of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see that thing happening. He always hung on to something and he only partially obeyed God. It wasn't until he totally separated, it was by himself that God began to pour out these blessings upon him. And again, most blessings in the Christian life are conditional. And God said these blessings on you would be conditional. If you will do this, I promise I'll do these eight things for you. And what a blessing that ended up being the life of Abraham. So the life of Abraham again comes back to telling us that God wants to do the same thing for us. His plan for us has not changed. After we're saved, he wants us to grow in the things of God. As we are growing in the things of God, God will send certain things along where he makes requests of us. Why? He knows we're able to handle it at the time. He doesn't ask us before that time. He asks us at that time. And I want you to have a copy of this particular series I have called Continuing in the Word, because that's where the key to Abraham's life was. He continued in the Word of God. See you right after the break. Heaven rejoices each time someone accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And as much as God is concerned with your conversion to Christ, He is also concerned with how you continue your Christian walk. Heaven will be filled with converts, but there will be far fewer disciples. Success in your walk with God is found when you continue in His Word. God wants you to have an abundant entrance into heaven, and that is only possible as you become a disciple of Jesus and study His Word. In this seven-part teaching by Bob Yandian, you'll gain insight into the importance of the Word for success in your daily life as a child of God. Lessons include, why do we go to church? power and refreshing, overcoming offenses, 
excuses and reasons, the cost of discipleship, the cost of commitment, and the lifestyle of a disciple. To order Continue in the Word, go to bobyandian.com or call 918-250-2207. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite or call 918-250-2207. Let's go back one more time to the verse I began with in Genesis chapter 12, verses one and two. Remember again, this is a test of Abraham's discipleship, not a test of his salvation. It's a test of his obedience to the Lord after salvation or spiritual growth. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, away from your relatives and your father's house, into a land that I will show you and I will make out of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Again, God told Abram to do one thing and that was to leave the security of his home, the security of his country, his relatives. And again, again, as I said before in the first half, he partially obeyed God. Yes, he got out of his land and took his wife with him, but he took his father and he took his nephew Lot. And of course, his father held him up in Aaron, in Haran, the city of Haran. And after seven years of being in Haran, finally his father died and Abram was able to go on into the promised land. But he took Lot with him. And Lot was one of those dependent guys, always dependent on Abram. And, fa- and probably what Abram thought as he was leaving the land was there was one man that uh, helped him and he was dependent upon. But now he has this one young man with him that was dependent on Abram. Abram was dependent on his father, so he took that ace in the hole with him. In case I need money, he's got plenty of money. His father died, Abram went on. Now he's got Lot with him and Lot is a needy person. And so Abram's probably thinking, I can't leave this kid behind. Yes, you can. God said leave him behind. He couldn't leave his father. Yes, I can because God said I can. And if God wants me to be all in all, and God wants me to depend on him as my all in all, then I'm gonna do that. I don't need my father, and someone else can take care of my nephew Lot, but that didn't happen. Of course, we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah later, which totally got Lot out of his life, and God could go on and bless Abram. But man, what a setback, what a holdback, and and Abram could have been further advanced down the road had he simply obeyed God totally in the beginning. But here's the point. Most of us, we look back on our life, God spoke to us. The first thing we think is we want something to hang on to. We want an ace in the hole. And uh, Lord, I know I'll take this church, but you know what? Listen, I'll, I'll keep this over on the side. And listen, sometimes it's fine in the beginning of your ministry if you have to, to have a job. I'm speaking to some of you ministers out there. In fact, let me just, just lay this out for you. Some of you know you have to have a job because the church can't support you at the moment, but you need to make plans down the road as that church begins to grow to finally turn loose of that job. And that may be a tough thing to do. Because, it, well, it brings in so much money a month and all this. It'll become a distraction later on. In the beginning, it might be necessary as the church is small enough. As the church begins to grow, you'll begin to notice this. Even people in the congregation say, Pastor, we want you to quit your job. We want you to be our full-time pastor of this church. But you keep having that thing like Abram did with his father, with his with his lot, lot his nephew. You got to hang on to this. No, turn loose of it and find out that God will truly be your all in all. He'll totally provide for you. And so again, this is the blessing God has made. Maybe the time is coming. In fact, for some of you, I just sense it right now. God's already spoken to you. It's time to let go of that job and you're not doing it. Simply be obedient to God and don't slow yourself down as Abram did here with his father and with his nephew. You turn loose of that thing and you go full time for God and totally thrust your your trust in him. And the moment you do, you'll begin to see God begin to provide for you and a peace will come on you. You'll have time to do what you really desire to do. And that's to be that full time pastor, that full time minister that God wants you to be. So again, God promised if Abram would do this one thing, he would do eight things for him. We're gonna break down what these eight things are. The first thing he says, I will take you into a land that I will show you. This is guidance, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's always leading the Holy Spirit, but the moment you fully trust in God and step out, you're about to hear things you've never heard before. The Holy Spirit delights in those who just utterly trust in him. And in the beginning, there was lots of direction the Lord gave him, but as he was going along further, there became less and less instruction from the Holy Spirit. Why is this so? It's so because of this one thing. The further you go on with God, 
What happens in your life is this, God can trust you. How much correction do you give your 15 year old as opposed to your four year old? You see, when you're young in the Lord, there's lots and lots of times the Holy Spirit will speak to you, God will show you things, people cross your path and all this, but later on in life, as you've been following the Lord for years, there's less of that and you begin to think, man, back years ago, the Lord spoke to me all the time. Well, what the Lord is simply saying is I can trust you. Now, when you face a problem, a scripture comes to you. Now, when you face a problem, you have a peace inside of you, things you didn't have earlier in your Christian life, and that's what God wants to do. He wants to not have to instruct you all the time so he can take care of other people. And he wants you to grow up in the Lord so you can help to handle other people. And this is what happened the further down the road that it got, God didn't speak to Abram as much as he did in the beginning when Abram was following him. And there's also times when, when Abram just totally disobeyed God and God just shut up for a while until Abram got his act together. But it wasn't an everyday thing where God spoke to Abram. We sometimes think it was. We read a story about a man named Elijah and how many times the Lord spoke to him, but we don't somehow realize that was spread over 20 some odd years. And you take the miracles they did, and that's probably one a year or one every couple of years. And you realize something, well, maybe, you know, I wasn't realizing this, but I remember last time the Lord spoke to me and I knew something from the Lord was two years ago. Well, that just simply means these past two years, God can trust you because the first thing you think of and what I should do is what does the scripture say? Do I have a direction of the Holy Spirit or is there a peace inside of me? One of the greatest direction finders is peace inside of you. So this is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Specific guidance tomorrow is based on obedience today. You want, a little bit, you want to have guidance tomorrow, then just be obedient today. Because once you're obedient, God can begin to show you more and more down the road of what you are to do to head you in the right path and keep you on the right path. Next of all, if you wonder why God's not speaking now, go back and check if you're doing the last thing he told you to do. I've had people tell me that, say, well, you know, I just feel like there's a change in my life, but if I somehow miss God and, and I think I'm going to just step out and try this over here, try this over here. No, don't you move until God speaks. And so if, if he hasn't spoken, what's the last thing he told you to do? Go back and be faithful to that. When Elijah was at the brook Cherith, the brook Cherith began to dry up. Now at the point when it began to dry up, that's the point we'd be looking around going, well, what, what, and we try to anticipate. I've only got a few days of water left right here. And then I, I've got to look out for something else. So you start looking right now. God doesn't always speak ahead of time or as much ahead of time as you want him to. The, the verse actually went on to say, the brook totally dried up and Elijah stayed there until the voice of the Lord came to him. What a great teaching on obedience to God. Even if everything around you totally dries up, don't you move until God speaks again. Even if everything around you is totally dried up, what's the last thing God told you to do? Come to the brook Cherith. So I've been at the brook Cherith, and then the Lord spoke to him about where to go next to the widow's house. So again, specific guidance is usually a monopoly for disciples only. General guidance from the word of God, general guidance on what to do can come to any believer, but specific guidance on what country to go to, what city within the country to go to, which house to go to, which building to buy, which side of the city, all these different things. There's things so specific, but that comes from your stepping out in obedience to the Lord. Number two, the Lord told him. Number one was he said, I'll show you a land. That's guidance. Number two, I'll make out of you a great nation. He would do something big in Abraham and God took something already in him to bring it out. When he said, I will make of you a great nation, the Greeks or the Hebrew says, I'll make out of you a great nation. That great nation was already in his heart. If I mean, if, if Abram would have thought about it from the time he received the Lord and began to walk with the Lord, he probably had this thing in him. Something's gonna, big's gonna happen inside of me. I see a nation inside of me and God finally spoke it. And when he spoke it, Abram thought, you know what? It's like, I've always known it. I've always thought that. But the Lord put in such specific verse and specific saying here, I will make out of you a great nation. And what he meant in Abram, he would do something big in Abram. And God took something already in him, brought it out and multiplied it right in front of him. How could he think God's going to make out of me a great nation when Abram looked around, all he had was him and Sarah. And then later on the road, him and Sarah and his son Isaac. And, and God's going to make something out of this. And then on the, way, on, the, on the way there, he also tried to have other aces in the hole. What he did was he went off to Egypt whenever there was a famine in the land. God didn't say go to Egypt. God said, I'll take care of you. And even in famine, he would have taken care of him. But he ran off to Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, he brought back little Egypt with him. Of course, we know that uh, this was the housemaiden. 
And the housemate he brought back with him, of course, he had another son through her called Ishmael, and it messed up the plan. I mean, they didn't totally destroy the plan. God just messed it up for a while, and God had to work other things around it, bring plan B in, but this is exactly what happened in his life. And sometimes we have to try to go out and drag something out of the world and bring with us, and it wasn't until he separated himself from, from, the, from the housemate and stuck with his wife and went with the promises of God that everything began to work out. But even by his death, he only had uh, one son, and then, you know, with the death of Sarah. And so he looked at that and probably thought, God's going to make out of me a great nation. The answer is yes, it's still yet to come. Many of the promises given to Abram, he did not see in his lifetime. They came to pass later on. He said, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. Number three, he said, I will bless you. All blessings, spiritual and natural, come from God. God said, I'll bless you. Bless him spiritually where he would have such a peace inside, a walk with God, at which God called him his friend, and he became so close to the Lord. This is so key in our life that, again, by obedience to the Lord today, we can draw closer to the Lord. And he said, I'll bless you. Next of all, great natural blessings came to him. Abraham became so wealthy that the wealth was so great that he and his son and nephew Lot, their, their money piles were running together, their cattle were getting all together. They had, finally had to separate from each other just to keep all their prosperity separated from each other. And of course, blessings are connected here to Abraham's obedience. He had to accept the will of God and walk in it, us too, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that's us. Number four, he said, I'll make your name great. This was his reputation. I'll make your name great. I'll make your reputation great. In the earth, as followers of God, God can do the same thing for us. He promises he will make our name great. Dignity is restored to us as reproach is taken away. I don't care what reproach the world has seen in us. I don't care what our background used to be. I tell Bible students all the time, you may be called back to the town you came from, and right now inside of yourself, you're groaning. Ugh. Do you know what my reputation was back there? I was known as a ladies' man and a carouser. I was known as a drunk. I was in jail. I, you know, I played pool and I just got into trouble all the time. And I had no, I, you know, you want me to go back to that place? God is simply saying, I'll take the reproach away and I'll give your name. I'll raise your reputation up in that town you came from. And after all, what a better testimony. I can take a jerk from that town and send him back and make him a great example, a great believer. In fact, you may even pastor a church in that town. Dignity is restored to us as reproach is taken away. The most important thing to God is not a title. He didn't say, I'll make your name great by sticking the name doctor on the front of it or a bishop on the front of it. You know, in churches I go to, predominantly white churches that I go to, it's the same thing. They want you to be a doctor. Predominantly when I go to the black churches, they want to be known as bishops. And they tell you, this will open up a door. What God was simply saying was, I'll make your name great. And the name is Abraham. We don't call him Dr. Abraham or Bishop Abraham. He's just Abraham to us because he said, I'll take and make your name great. I have been asked it numbers of times, the people from uh, universities, they want to give me an honorary doctorate, and they'll tell me, and some will say, no, this will actually count with all the works you've done in your life, we'll put it together, and this will be a real thing for you. And I tell them, I don't want it. They don't understand why I don't want it. I said, I enjoy coming to a meeting, and there's doctors' names all along here, at the bottom is Bob, Bob Yandian. And I enjoy that. In fact, I've had people tell me, thank you, in a world full of doctors, here's Bob. He was not known as Dr. Paul or Dr. Dr. Peter, he was just Peter, it was just Paul. So I will see you tomorrow. And please, in the meantime, get a copy of this particular teaching on Continue in the Word of God. See you manana. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. You can order resources become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.